followed by the other two items. Right. Okay. And then also I'm adding an item for this afternoon. I'm adding free park entrance and fishing days presentation by Linda Lanterman. Um, I'm going to add it at the end of the general discussion this afternoon. So after the military deer seasons. All right. I did send that out to your commissioners and to you, Brad. It. So you have it so you can see it. Okay. Uh, well, let's talk about the minutes of the previous meeting. Are there any additions or corrections? Hearing none, would anyone venture a uh, motion that they be approved as presented? Commissioner Ryder, move to accept minutes as presented. Commissioner Sill, second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, Commissioner Ryder has done a good job in remembering to state his name, although most of us know how uh, it uh, each other sounds. I'm the worst offender. I will try to do a better job. Uh, at this point, we encourage and welcome public discussion on non-agenda items, public comment on non-agenda items. Is there anybody in the audience who has anything they'd like to discuss? Have something you want to discuss, go ahead and use the raise hand function. You can find that under the reactions button. We'll call on you. Do you see any anybody? Not see anybody at this point, Commissioner Lauber. All right. Then why don't we move to the agency and state fiscal status report from Secretary Loveless? Thank you, Chairman Lauber. This is. Uh, Secretary Brad Lovelace, I might point out by way of introductions, I was remiss. Um, you all are aware that Chris Timison has, has left us for other employment, but Terry Bruce, who you can see on your screen, is, is our, um, our other counselor. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, while we're interviewing for a new chief counsel, Terry has very ably stepped into this broader role to help us get started with the legislature and to also deal with administrative regulations with the commission. So we appreciate Terry's help and and uh, and you can call on him if you have a, a legal question. So uh, saying that, um, the update on our, our uh, fiscal status is, some of you may have seen uh, the, the uh, state of the state address the other night and the presentation by uh, the director of budget yesterday the governor's budget recommendations include a total agency budget of approximately $96 million. Um, so a healthy budget. Of course, you all are aware it's, it's the money that you all in buying licenses and, and buying gear um, end up sending our way. So I appreciate that. But nevertheless, it's included under the governor's total budget. Um, park fee funds for our state parks finished the calendar year 2021 with an increase over calendar year 2020 uh, of about three and a half percent. So the current fiscal year receipts are up slightly over last year um, and, and are all significantly higher than the long-term average for receipts that uh, as we continue to see an elevated interest in our state parks. So we're happy about that. We appreciate the, the higher receipts. And of course our expenses are higher. So we need those in order to keep keep things open and in good shape. The cash balance in the park fee fund at the end of calendar year was 8.6 million. So a healthy balance. The cabin revenue, uh, that is the gross revenue for parks and public lands uh, for calendar year 2021 finished up 5.4% uh, higher than the previous year. 
Um, so the current fiscal year, we're down about 4% compared to last year, but as you all are aware, we're in the winter, it's early. And so we, we haven't seen the, the main numbers come in yet, but, but uh, certainly uh, we finished off last year in good shape. Wildlife fee fund results were up significantly during the calendar year because of the, the, all the demand for our, our services. For calendar year 2021, total receipts were just shy of 40 million, 9.6 million. This is an increase over calendar year 2020, which you recall was a good year, of over 20%. The current fiscal year receipts for the first two quarters are 11.3 million, a 4% increase over that same period last year. Uh, the current balance in the wildlife fund at the end of last year was 26.2 million. So again, a healthy wildlife fee fund balance. The agency has received a preliminary apportionment for uh, wildlife sport fish restoration grant programs. That is a PR and J that we always refer to. This is based on receipts for the first three quarters of fiscal year uh, 2021. And uh, the final apportionment is expected in, in uh, February or March of this year. For wildlife restoration receipts, that is Pittman Robertson, the preliminary apportionment exceeds the total apportionment for last year. So we forecasted this with you in our previous meeting. The receipts were so strong that, uh, that, that we were already surpassing last year's total after the third quarter. The preliminary uh, fiscal year 2022 Pittman-Robertson apportionment was 14.9 million as compared to the, the previous years of 12.4 million. We anticipate our final Pittman-Robertson apportionment could be as high as $20 million. So that's a, that's a terrific change uh, that we'll benefit from. Sport fish restoration receipts to the end of the federal fiscal year were down slightly from last year, but still above the 10-year average. Our decline last year appeared to be uh, due to lower receipts for fishing equipment. As we've said before, that surprises us all given the bare shells that we saw, but because um, uh, our understanding was they were producing as much or more than they had in the past, and it was just flying off the shelves. Nevertheless, the receipts that the federal government has to use so far for the sport fish restoration money are down a little bit. Um, the, the total apportionment last year was 5.8, uh, and this year we think we could be in that 5.5 to 5.6 million range. So not a huge drop, but, but certainly not what we hope for or what we expect. So more to come on that. The last category I want to mention to you is the boat fee fund. The boat boating fee fund is really the third leg of the core sources, the three sources that the department depends upon for agency operation. And this is focused, as you might imagine, on boating safety, education, and access infrastructure to support the boating public. Calendar year 2021 receipts the boat fee fund were 1.9 million, which is a 24% increase over calendar year 2020. Fiscal year 2022 year-to-date receipts are $654,000, pretty similar to that same period for fiscal year 2021. The, both the 2021 and 2022 fiscal year uh, numbers are well above our long-term average. So things are trending in a positive direction um, we have lots of uses for that boat fee fund, as you can imagine, and you'll hear from our staff periodically. So uh, the, the state of the agency budget is healthy. Uh, that would conclude my report, Mr. Chairman. Are there any, are there any questions for uh, Secretary Loveless? Well, I always like to see more healthy budgets. And uh, so that's good. Uh, having no questions, uh, Terry, you want to talk about the legislative update? Yes, if it pleases the commission, Mr. Chairman, um, you know, with uh, Chris leaving, um, we're kind of thrown in here. Um, the secretary, uh, Steve Adams and Myself have been kind of keeping an eye on it. I'd like to just uh, highlight some of last year's successes that Chris helped accomplish and then look at the main issues for the legislative session and some of the 
legislative agenda items, the department will be covering it this time in possible agenda items and maybe uh, just keep you informed on some bills that might be of some concern through the session that we're aware of right now. Um, highlights from last year include the ERO 48 that transferred uh, the Division of Tourism over to Commerce that was enacted. Um, we were able to defeat House Bill 2025, or at least it, it wasn't passed, that restricted law enforcement's uh, ability to access um, land or surveil land. Um, that would have had a um, chilling effect on our law enforcement activities. Uh, we passed uh, Senate Bill 159 that authorized the purchase of 178, 78 acres of ground in Kingman County next to Byron Walker. Um, we're going to be purchasing that. In fact, uh, the contract, um, some changes are being negotiated right now on the purchase contract with Ducks Unlimited. Hopefully, we'll have a agreed to contract as early as next week that uh, uh, can be executed between the parties. Senate Bill 142 was passed that allows uh, the references to the guidelines of the American Fishery Society uh, in the commercialization of wildlife uh, statute. Um, we can now reference those in our rules and regulations, and I believe that was already taken place. The main issues for 2022, you may have heard about, so I won't uh, spend too much time on it, but the first one is redistricting. This will be the first time in 40 years that a incumbent governor will be running for re-election while the legislature is drawing its, uh, its uh, boundary maps for their Senate and House districts. So that'll be an exciting uh, negotiation to watch. Um, tax rebates have been proposed by the governor's office. Um, the sales tax on food exemption has been proposed by the governor's office and uh, the uh, and also a possible opponent, uh, Attorney General Schmidt. Uh, the legislature has had different iterations of a full uh, sales tax exemption on food through the years. Uh, the state coffers being what they are, um, this will be uh, interesting to see how tax rebates and sales tax exemptions uh, play into uh, the passing of the budget. We know that the 2023 fiscal year budget won't pass until those other two issues are resolved in some <coughs> way. And as the secretary alluded to, uh, so far, uh, the department as an agency got a very favorable uh, governor's recommendation for their budget. Um, uh, other two items, the wildfires in West, Northwest, Central, North Central Kansas. Uh, we could probably see some uh, wildlife relief activities, probably a sales tax uh, exemption on those uh, supplies for maybe re for new fences for uh, uh, farms that were damaged. Um, you'll also see uh, FEMA and the state share of FEMA funds being directed towards those counties that qualify. And then lastly, uh, COVID-19. Um, there's <clears throat> some legislation probably going to be uh, proposed in response to a uh, declaration of emergencies and there'll be issues with federal funds, uh, part of the, the president's budget that will come into play is how those are spent by, the, uh, by, by Kansas. Um, so far for the 2022 year um, legislative session, uh, the department <coughs> is looking at proposing a a reconciliation bill of some sort um, that will follow up on the ERO 48 that transferred tourism into commerce. We um, There's just some portions of the statute book that does not yet acknowledge that transfer of, as taking place. So we just wanna make sure that that gets consistent. Also, this was an issue I believe brought up by the commission and that is a lifetime hunting license for uh, those who qualify for a Native American tribe. 
um, as being a member for the Native American tribe so far, or right now, KSA 32929 requires that um, the per a person applying for a Kansas lifetime hunting license prove that they have 116th uh, Native American heritage and that they also belong to a uh, recognized tribal unit. This would remove the 116th Native American heritage requirement from Kansas statute um, for uh, several reasons, but uh, we don't want anybody reproving to themselves that they're a member of a Native American tribe. Whoever is enrolled on the Native as being a member of the Native American tribe, that uh, in our opinion, that suffices for that burden and they should qualify for that. Uh, license privilege. Um, there might be the opportunity for some CORA exemptions that impact threatened and endangered species to be rolled into a governor's office request uh, dealing with a, a Kansas Open Records Act. Um, we will be putting forward an affinity license plate bill. Uh, hopefully we can get that introduced uh, uh, it's at the revisers. We've been working with the revisers, the Department of Revenue, and um, our staff. Uh, there'll be the option of four plates um, that one would denote uh, parks, another one would be wildlife uh, uh, game, uh, then uh, non non game species. And I take that back. I think we have two wildlife plates in question right now. Uh, the the uh, license templates have already been prepared. Uh, we, we have to work through uh, budget and DMV as to how the funds are split up <clears throat> and uh, where they go to make it as simple as possible. Um, there, as part of the governor's budget, we saw a 5% proposed increase for employee salaries uh, that we'd be keeping an eye on. Uh, we also saw the governor's proposal that Kansas police and fire, which are law enforcement agents at the department would qualify for um, that um, they would, I'm sorry, I misspoke. Uh, it would allow our law enforcement certified employees to be placed under the Kansas police and fire uh, capers benefits. This is something that uh, Secretary Loveless has been advocating for for a few years. Uh, it's got full support of the governor's office uh, this go around. We do not anticipate any land bills or large land purchases uh, this year to be have to be approved by the legislature. Um, a few things that we're going to be keeping an eye on uh, left over from last year <laughs> was a bill that would grant uh, lifetime <clears throat> hunting privileges to those who were honorably discharged. Uh, after 20 years of service from the National Guard, that's something we'd keep an eye on. And if uh, that starts to moving, we, we'd definitely engage in. Um, there was also last year a transferability of landowner and or tenant uh, deer hunting uh, permits that comes up every now and again. Uh, we definitely want to uh, be engaged and ready for that if it were to um, uh, be debated and House Bill 2456 was uh, pre filed by uh, Representative Corbett. It would establish a $200 um, lifetime hunting license if purchased for an individual between the ages of zero and five, as far as we can tell. Um, then once they obtain uh, the normal, the age where they'd be required to purchase the uh, license, they'd be granted a lifetime hunting license. Our current lifetime hunting license, which uh, the commission sets uh, and could set the value up to $1,000 per lifetime hunting license is currently set at, I believe, $962.50, just to put that into perspective. Um, so that kind of gives you an overview uh, what we'll be working on, engaged in, and uh, uh, keeping an eye on. And I'd stand for any questions if you if you have some. Commissioner Escarino, uh, 
chairman, Mr. Chairman, or yes. Terry. Um, the property that by the Byron Walker in Kingman County, is that to the east, west, north, south? Whereabouts is that located at? Anybody know? They, <laughs> when I toured it, uh, it was a different, it was going to be a different piece of property. In order to appease local landowners, there's a bit of a land swap to, uh, to, to accommodate uh, some tenants. And Mr. Secretary? Yeah, yeah. Th thank you, Mr. Chair and Terry. Um, uh, Secretary Lovelace. Yeah, Phil, if you're familiar with the ground, it's on the far west edge, just south of the river. So it's in that corner where the county road comes up from the south and crosses the river, uh, right in between that county road and the existing property off to the east on the south side of the river, right there. Okay. To Terry's point, we ended up, Ducks Unlimited was creative and we all worked together with local landowners to listen to what their needs were for crop ground and made some trades. So we felt like it, it turned out to be a really good deal for our customers in getting better access to a large portion uh, as well as river access. So really a positive deal. So south of Kingman Lake uh, and, and a little bit west of it there a little. Right. West, okay. Yeah, south, south and then clear west end of the property um, <clears throat> uh, is exactly where it is. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Chairman Lauber here. Uh, Terry, the uh, bill that was pre-filed by Representative Corbett, that would basically instead, for example, if you have grandchildren and you want to buy them a lifetime hunting license, it'd be $200 instead of $962, which would maybe bring income in in the front end, but long term, that would have a deleterious effect on our finances, wouldn't it? There, there would be um, a loss in two ways. Um, you'd have to compare it into to a couple um, scenarios. One is compared to the existing price of a lifetime hunting license. Um, and second, what what is that going to do when we pull down our... Uh, <laughs> um, DJ or, or PR money. Um, currently, there's a there's a federal match there. Uh, the issue you run into with any lifetime hunting scenario is those rules are not static. The feds can change it at some time. And if we have a large contingency of lifetime hunting licenses, they may no longer qualify for that federal uh, drawdown. So, uh, uh, Steve Adams has been working out different, uh, in fact, he just before the meeting started, uh, had a, passed out a, a spreadsheet to show uh, some of those losses. Um, it's actually significant if that individual were to um, otherwise buy an annual license, a combo each year, that's a very large loss uh, compared to that revenue. But um, we also lose because if somebody were to buy a lifetime license and move out of the state of Kansas, um, if they were, they would be treated as a Kansas resident to use our resources um, and they, they wouldn't have to qualify for a non-resident permit. So there, there's a few ways of looking at this. Um, the current statute gives the commission the authority um, to set that rate up to a thousand dollars, but it could already do what, uh, the, the bill is requesting that we do. So perhaps at, at some point it becomes a broader discussion as to what our life, our existing, um, framework for license for lifetime hunters would, would look like. Well, you answered my question, which is going to be my next question relative to DJ and PR monies. And, uh, well, monitor that. Yeah. Secretary Loveless. Yeah, Mr. Chair, thank you, uh, Secretary Loveless. Uh, Terry gave a great summary. One thing we want to make sure everybody's aware of is that we love the idea of figuring out a way to engage our, our citizens at a younger age and, and uh, help their families support their commitment to you know, a lifetime of enjoying the Kansas outdoors. We're just trying to figure out the numbers to make sure it doesn't end up hurting 
all the rest of our participants in terms of the federal aid we're able to leverage with that. So we're trying to take a big picture look at this and figure out if there's a way that we can maybe suggest some adjustments and, and make it really a positive thing for everybody concerned so that the agency and our users aren't penalized. So, so we're, we're working hard to, to do all the math like Terry referenced. Okay. Uh, Jeremy, any... Mr. Chairman, Phil S. Carino, uh, Garden City. Uh, with regards to the fires in, in uh, uh, North Central Kansas, uh, South Central Kansas earlier, does the Kansas Department of Wildlife have any, uh, do they offer any assistance in replenishing, let's say, pheasant, quail, duck, anything that may have uh, got um, hurt during those fires? And, and do they offer any assistance or request maybe the state uh, aid in uh, replenishing the, the wildlife for that particular area? Go ahead, Brad. Yeah, thank you, Secretary Loveless. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, uh, Commissioner Escarino, good question. I mean, for us, uh, it's all about habitat management, right? You can, we know that if you, if you plant animals in hopes that uh, a significant percentage survive and, and then re reproduce, that's a, a kind of a losing proposition. That's kind of throwing, throwing money away. So, okay. but what will be important to your point is going back and working with those landowners. We have lots of options for habitat programs on the ground and uh, to, to go in and engage with those folks to help restore that critical habitat that those, those deer and, and quail and pheasant all require. So uh, I, I appreciate your question because we haven't had a dialogue that I'm aware of about if um, if we might be able to get some extra tools to go into that focus area, given that that devastating fire that they had. We know the governors reached out and 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 created uh, easier pathways for people to you know restore other aspects of their lives there. Certainly, the wildlife is a, an important aspect, and I appreciate your question. I'll make a note here that we ask those questions of our people in the field, what extra tools could you use to be more effective with those landowners that, that suffered through this so we can restore things more quickly? So great question, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Are there any other questions for Secretary Loveless or Terry Bruce? Yeah, uh, Commissioner Ryder, uh, Mr. Bruce, is the license plates, is that similar to kind of what you would see if you go to the DMV and uh, you know, they got the different universities or Ducks Unlimited. It, so it'd be like $35 for that license and 20 goes to the department and 15 to the DMV. Is that similar? I've, I'm starting to see that in a lot of other states, you know, so I'm wondering if it's similar to that. Right. Um, the, the legislation that we're trying to copy as closely as possible would be similar to that for our Regents institutions, Ducks Unlimited, the breast cancer license plate bill, uh, it would give the, <coughs> excuse me, it'd give the commission the authority to set the price of the license tag between 40 to $100. Um, the, the split is going to be between uh, uh, the, the parks fund and, and the uh, give it, um, wildlife fee fund and also non game speech, chickety checkoff. So, um, a portion of that, what makes this tag a little different than what other states have done is that uh, other states, it, they treated it as a donation. Ours will allow you to have access to the parks through a park pass that you normally could, could do at uh, uh, registering your vehicle. So ours will give you a privilege. The remainder of that tag's expense would then be treated as a donation. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Ryder again. And one other thing, um, the department was trying to get through the, the license fee cap. I, I don't know if we got that all the way through. And I just kind of wonder where we were with that. I know it's election year coming up. And so uh, I was just kind of getting a feel for where we are with that, uh, with the cap license fees. Thank you. Um, uh, Terry Bruce again. Um, 
you, you answered your question. Uh, it is an election year. It does not uh, seem to have the, the attention that the legislature should probably give it at, at this time. Um, understandably, that, um, I, I guess, um, it is something we do have to keep an eye on. Um, at some point, it's been, correct me if I'm wrong, it, it's been a number of years since there was a, there was a fee increase. And, and uh, um, right now, things look really good in the budget, but that won't always be the case. We know that historically. Yeah, Commissioner Ryder, uh, um, I'm not looking to, you know, I think it's 2016 when we increased, and I'm not looking to increase, but just kind of wondering where we were with that cap, just after a, a few more years, you know, things will probably start tightening, especially with inflation and, and, and just other things along those lines. So appreciate the input. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Lover, is there any other questions for Secretary Loveless or Terry? Uh, Commissioner Spore. Brad, how, how big a deal is this license fee cap to the agency? Is it is it a big deal or or a little deal or how 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 important is this? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the question, um, Secretary Loveless. Um, it's important. Um, you you all have have been connected with this process long enough to know that what typically happens is that we. Um, get a get a, a cap increase, and right now we have several of our fees that are are bumped into that. They can't go any higher uh, for important things, uh, things that are mean significant amounts of money to the health of the agency. Uh, we we talked earlier about all that federal money that's available. Those were all apportionments to us, but we have to use our money to leverage that, right? So unless we raise fees locally through those licenses that you're talking about. We can't access that that abundant federal money right now. So it is very important that we be able to raise those over time. Are we in crisis in, in 2022, January? We aren't in crisis. Um, our folks are very frugal. One of the things that I've found in my, in my three years with the agency is our people are very good stewards of the money that, that you entrust them with. And they are careful so they don't overspend, but there's clearly more we could do if we had more money in our in our fee funds to leverage that, that federal money. And um, so we're trying to be good stewards, but while it's not a crisis today, that's inevitable. We've run into that historically where we, we, uh, we're capped in a number of areas. We get into a tight fiscal time. I mean, we've had some extreme uh, challenges fiscally in the past because of running into those caps. So we're trying to stay ahead of that and get some, some headroom or another philosophy that we are entertaining is the idea of maybe tying it somehow to the consumer price index. There's some negatives with that, but what we want to, because historically we have been really modest in our increases and, and we aren't outlandish as we make these, we pay attention to what our neighboring states charge what we think the market will bear, just like any business would. Um, and, but nevertheless, um, we, we're gonna have to come up with something and fairly soon, but to, to Terry's comments, the legislature's focused on a lot of about big issues this session. It's difficult, plus at a time where there's a lot of um, tax money that, that they're dealing with, um, that, that's a broad brush they paint everything with. And they say, there's plenty of taxes over here in the general fund. So you guys shouldn't be asking for money in your fund, even though we're, we're disconnected from that. Nevertheless, it's hard for people to discern that. So it's a very difficult time now for us to have that conversation. But we can't wait for long, right? We can't. We may not be able to deal with it this session because of everything else that's working. But we have to get right back to it and get very serious about how we can create some more headroom and to be healthy in, in the upcoming years. When Chairman Lauber, when we tried to do that the last time, we did a decent job, but it was poorly reported by the media. And the confusion became that here we are again, going to raise our fees after we just raised them in 2016, which was not the case. Um, 
and that created a lot of confusion and uh, it was too bad because now we probably have to wait till at least next year to start again and try to figure out how to make it transparent so that we can explain that we're not raising fees now but we want the opportunity to be able to raise them later and we'll raise them as conditions dictate within the agency right yeah. uh, any yeah. other questions for secretary loveless well terry thank you very much thank you brad uh Nadia, you want to talk about constituent inquiries and emails? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Nadia Reimer, Chief of Public Affairs and Engagement Officer for the agency. Um, just wanted to circle back to a few things, especially since uh, we have a new commissioner, and then just add a couple helpful reminders to kind of get this year off to the right start. Um, uh, the first thing is just a brief I wanted to briefly review the ways in which our constituents can contact you. So currently the agency has three offerings. Right now, an individual could go to ksoutdoors.com and select the contact us button. In that case, the agency would share that communication directly with commissioners. The second option that's available to constituents is that they can obviously call you as commissioners directly or send you an email directly. Um, none of those options will be changing. And then the third option that if you recall, we instituted this uh, last year was a collective email account that's called KDWPT Correspondence. And that's an email account that is shared by both commissioners and select staff within the agency. So this is still a fairly new process that we're utilizing, but the thought behind that is it would eliminate some of the legwork for you as commissioners in terms of having to juggle emails back and forth either between each other or with the agency. And this, in this regard, when a constituent reaches out, they're hitting all of the necessary parties at one time, and then we're able to better track those communications. So as part of the KD, KDWPT correspondence email, um, there's an online form that the constituent fills out. It gives us some basic information about who they are, where they reside in the state. They have the ability, obviously, to leave open-ended comments, but there's a, there's a checkbox that they need to identify. So they can either say, I just want to share my thoughts with you. I don't necessarily need a response. The second option is, I'd like to share my thoughts with you, and I do expect a response. And then the third option is, I'd like to share my thoughts with you. I'd like a response and I'd like the commission to consider this as a future item for discussion during a public meeting. We've had some discussions internally um, about the efficiency of this and whether or not it's meeting uh, the goals that we set forth. Um, and if you recall, those goals are really, we're, we're trying to do two things. We're trying to ensure um, that staff and commissioners aren't having to duplicate efforts so just increase efficiency overall, but we're also trying to ensure that no one constituent inquiry goes unanswered. So part of that solution was also instituting a log that Commission Secretary uh, Sheila Chemis has been kind enough to maintain for us. But going back to those designations, those check boxes that the uh, constituent can click, we had some discussions about whether or not that's helping us meet our goals. And the third one where they can say, I would like this to be considered for a, a future public meeting. Um, our, our thinking is that that's probably not necessary at this point. Based on the communications that we've seen and responded to, um, most of these topics are items that either the commission has already heard and discussed and perhaps the constituent just wasn't aware or there are items that are in the process of being um, worked on. And in so that regard, um, the solution that I, I'm, I'm going to put before you guys is that we get rid of that third option and we simply just maintain an open invite to anyone at any time to come before you guys and pose those ideas to you directly. Um, th this will simplify the process even further. Um, so uh, if you guys don't have any issues with that, uh, we will remove that third option and then just simply ask the constituents would you like a response or do you sh simply want to share your thoughts with us? And then we'll conduct commission business as usual. I have two other items I'd like to share, but any thoughts on that 
uh, before we finalize that? Serum and lava, I think that's fine. Okay. All right. Um, the other two items, um, because the KD KDWPT correspondence email is a shared account, I uh, just wanted to share with you guys that no need to forward those to anybody else. Um, it has all commissioners um, and, the, and the appropriate staff within the agency. Um, so uh, once that email comes to KDWPT correspondence, we'll reach back out to you if there's any need for direct communication. Otherwise, just know that you can log into that account um, and view those emails at any time. It, like I said, it's a shared account. Um, it's only if you get an, an email sent directly to you as a commissioner and you wish for us to see it, in that case, go ahead and forward it. And then the last item is, I just wanted to reiterate the importance of this communication log that Sheila's maintaining. This is a fantastic resource in the sense that you as a commissioner have access to this. It's on a shared drive and you can log on at any time to see what are the topics that um, constituents have been bringing up historically, um, maybe who responded. Um, so if you have any questions or let's say you wanna reach out to a particular constituent, but you don't recall maybe um, when that email came through, that's a really great resource to be able to loop back um, and revisit some of those conversations if you see it necessary. So that's all I have. Thank you for your time. Okay, any questions for Nadia? Uh, Commissioner Spore, uh, Nadia, I logged on to my Wildlife and Parks account and I noticed that some of the emails were in my focus box, which I primarily look at. And then I had dug into kind of the general emails where there's lots of office closings and things like that. And I had noticed that there was also some emails in there that were directed towards the commission that were, I guess the word collected is what I always look for. Mm -hmm. Is that something that is gonna routinely happen or is that shortfall that didn't get put into the focus box? Thank you, Commissioner Spore. Nadia Reimer, Chief of Public Affairs and Engagement Officer. Um, I'm actually gonna defer to uh, Jason Dixon over in IT and he can kind of explain why the email is set up in that fashion. Yeah, uh, Commissioner Spore and everybody, the focus box is kind of a, is a term determined by Microsoft where there's some rules in the back end that kind of decide if it's focused or not. Since these emails are kind of coming from a server, it's kind of sporadic. Um, I believe if you right click, on that, on if you find if you see any emails under other that you would like to be in the future under focus, I believe you can right click and then um, select them as add to focused inbox, and then they'll come up into your focused inbox. It's just kind of a we we can't manually. I've talked to OITS a little bit about that. There's nothing on our side that we can do to force that into that focused inbox because of how the algorithm works with Microsoft. So, um, but yeah, if you, so I believe if you right click it or if you select it, uh, you can make it go up there. And so future ones will go up there in that sense. Thank you. Yep. Commissioner Escarino, uh, question for Nadia. I um, had received uh, a couple of, uh, I've received two phone calls and I had a personal meeting with an individual with regards to uh, some hunting on family owned property and some hunting on the property with an out of state uh, family member. And um, they had some questions with regards. And, and I said, you know, I'm new at this. I'm learning the process. I'm going to go through it and, and get through it the best. With those meetings that I had, I took notes. Is that something that I go into the form and fill out and submit to uh, the, the commission or do I ask the constituents to input their information um, or fill it out, submit it back to them, make sure that I've um, made, made the notes properly and, and send it back to them? Or how, how should I take care of that? And then the other one was with regards to uh, extending uh, um, uh, the coyote season uh, with regards to, uh, I don't know, night hunting or something to that nature. So. I wanted to make sure that I cop, you know, get get that information out there. So 
you you touched on some great points for me uh, being a new commissioner to to learn that process. Absolutely. Thank you, Commissioner Escarino. Um, Nadia Reimer, Chief of Public Affairs. So uh, the answer to your questions are, are yes. So there's really no wrong way for you to communicate with our agency. We want to be as accessible as possible. Um, in this instance where you're getting phone calls or maybe having a private meeting, um, at any time you can just give us a call directly uh, and verbally share those items with us or shoot an email. In fact, um, I'd be happy to follow up this discussion with an email to you of who you would contact within the agency to start those uh, getting those correct answers. Um, in terms of the online form, if you want to direct constituents to that online form, um, I would say that's probably the second best option, uh, but don't feel that you need to you know, duplicate your efforts and get back with them just for that purpose. Um, what we can do and what we want to do is, is serve as that main focal focus point for you guys as commissioners. So don't worry about having the right answers. That's what our field staff, our biologists, they're there for. So okay. simply get that, get that contact information to us. Uh, let us know what the, the highlights are, and then we'll make sure to contact the appropriate staff craft a response, and then we'll CC you on it so that you're aware that that communication loop has been closed. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I might add, this is Brad Loveless, Secretary. So yeah, Nadia gave a very complete picture. What we're trying to do is simplify this, make sure we, we don't uh, have anybody fall through the cracks. So Sheila is that first point of contact. She's, she's the, 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 office that everything goes through and then she engages all the rest of us. Certainly Nadia's shop is big in that and then the other appropriate people throughout the agency. But for you all as commissioners, Sheila is kind of one-stop shop and we want to, want to, she's very attentive, very responsive and she's where you can always start with and then we'll navigate, you know, other communications. We, we de definitely don't want to cut you out of any communications, but we want to make sure we're effective in sharing information and making your jobs as easy as possible. Lauren. Fisher Sill, um, first of all, Sheila, thank you. Nadia, thank you. Um, I appreciate um, not worrying about whether people are getting respected uh, in their responses and things and not having to do that. Um, I want to also say, Thank you to the staff and the responses. The responses that the staff give to some of those inquiries have been hugely educational for me. And so I appreciate getting copies of those. I've learned things I did not have any clue about and um, am just reaffirmed in my um, respect and admiration for our staff. And one, their, their ability to communicate um, but what is reflected as far as their proficiencies and competencies in their work. So to me, that's a huge win-win all the way around. My one question, Nadia, how do we access that shared drive to see that log? Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Sill. Nadia Reimer, Chief of Public Affairs. Um, I'm, I'm so glad you brought up both the, uh, the value that our staff bring to these responses. They're really the ones doing the hard work. Um, they're putting a lot of time and effort into providing really solid data to these constituents and really um, treating each uh, response on a case-by-case -case basis. So especially our wildlife division, um, they, they have been doing a phenomenal job. So I'm so glad you said that. In terms of how to access that log, um, we can just go ahead and send you a link um, today so that you have that fresh in your inbox. And then my recommendation would be that you go ahead and bookmark that on whatever browser you're using so you can kind of quickly access it. Um, one more thing I might note, and I know Assistant Secretary Miller had his hand up, so I, I won't go too long, um, but uh, one of the items that, that actually Secretary Loveless had brought up, which I'm so glad he thought of this, was you know, utilizing the previous process that we did when someone indicated they wanted an item brought forth before you guys for discussion, that's before they actually receive a response from our staff. 
So the reality is, and we hope the reality is for every constituent, is that their questions are actually being answered directly by our field staff. And so that also might uh, negate the necessity of bringing it forth in front of the commission at, an early, at a later time, because it's possible their concerns have actually already been addressed. Um, so just wanted to add that last, that last note, but we'll be sure to get you guys a, an updated link today. Okay, Mike. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mike Miller, Assistant Secretary and Pratt. I just wanted to add um, mainly for uh, Commissioner Escarino's uh, benefit that to, if, there, if there's an issue that's brought up to you in a meeting or a phone call and it's time sensitive and you really need that person to be contacted, don't hesitate to give me a call, give Nadia a call. Um, if we can't call right, at, right then and, and, and respond, we will find somebody who can. Secretary Lovelace, I'm sure, would be happy to take those calls. If it's just a general information, we can go through the process that, that you described and, and what Nadia described. But if it's a, if it's a time sensitive issue or answer, this, we've done this in the past, Commissioner will give us a call and, and I will uh, make contact with that constituent and we don't have any problems doing that, so. Okay, any other questions? Okay, thank you, Nadia. Now, general discussion, commissioner permit update and drawing. I don't know how we're going to draw, so Mike's probably got that figured out. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mike Miller, Assistant Secretary. I apologize for not being here during the introductions. I was a little complacent, and uh, we were on Zoom so much, I didn't go to check into my Zoom meeting early enough. And for whatever reason on this, this try, my computer would not log into Zoom. So I had to shut it down and restart and I finally got into the meeting. So I apologize for that. So we actually drew virtually last year um, and I drew here with, I all have the, the, the container and the, and the numbered balls on the, on the video so everybody can see them, but we'll do that as we go. And I'll, I'll just draw by proxy for each one of the commissioners. But first I wanna give everybody a little bit of background on the commissioner permit. Um, program, and this is through KSA 32970. It actually started in 2006, and it gives the commission the ability to issue seven big game permits. Um, there, you can issue one elk, one antelope, or up to seven deer permits, and these are any deer permits statewide, any equipment during uh, the legal season, any season with uh, equipment legal for that. They're available by a lottery draw to nonprofit uh, conservation organizations and local uh, chapters operating in Kansas uh, that actively promote wildlife conservation and the hunting and fishing heritage. Um, if, a, if, a, if a chapter or an organization is drawn, um, they will pay for that permit. Um, they can then uh, auction that permit off to the highest bidder. Once they sell that permit, the cost of the permits um, subtracted, 15% is taken out of that. And then that, the rest of the 85% is set back to the agency with a proposal for a conservation project. Once that project is agreed upon, that money goes back to that conservation organization to do that, to do that program. The only difference would be if Kansas uh, hunters helping, Kansas farmers and hunters helping the hungry Drew, they would basically keep the entire amount um, uh, to, to, to help their program. Um, amazingly, since 2006, uh, we have sold permit, the permits have sold for more than a million dollars and we've raised $903,000 for conservation. Um, last year was pretty interesting, and I'll compare it to the very first year. In 2006, we had 59 applications. Uh, the permits sold for a total of $49,000. Last year, we had 208 applications. The permits sold for a total of $218,000, and we set a new record last year. One deer permit sold for $41,000. So there, people are figuring this program out. It's a, there's these, these any deer statewide, any season deer per, uh, permits are highly sought after, and the money is going to a really good cause. Um, for example, some of those, those causes might be, some of the, like the DU chapters might put it all back into uh, the uh, Bringing Back the Bottoms project or the Pheasant Initiative or, you know, major habitat programs that we have, or a lot of them have designated that money for youth events, youth hunts, and, and youth outdoor skills programs. So the money is going to good um, causes. And so with that, uh, I will say we had 176 eligible applications this year. And, and what I have here is any of the commissioners that have been around this before, I've seen this and I've got the balls in here. 
And so I will go down the list that I have of commissioners and draw by proxy. I will draw a number. Uh, Sheila will say what organization or chapter that is associated with, and we'll keep track of that. Uh, and so unless we have any questions, I will move straight to the drawing. Move straight to the drawing. Okay, so my first on the list, and it's, again, it's in alphabetical order. So this is for uh, Commissioner Cross. I'm going to draw. I have number 34, Sheila. Okay, number 34 is Ducks Unlimited Independence Chapter, and their choice was deer. And I will add that the deer are the most sought after permits. Initially, elk was one of the more popular ones, but now most of these applications, their first choice is a deer permit. So it's just, I think, easier to sell an auction on. Mike, these deer permits are, you could utilize them in addition to one purchased over the counter. Or yes, correct. Uh, this is the only time you can get two permits that will allow you to take a buck. Per, a buck. So if you, if you, even a non-resident, if they drew a permit and then they purchase one of these, they can have two, two permits in their possession and utilize them during the season. So I'm gonna draw now for Commissioner Escarino. Number 12, Sheila. Okay. Number 12 is Safari Club Internationals, Kansas City. And their choice is an elk. There we go. Forget what I said earlier. All right, I'm gonna draw for uh, Commissioner Gefeller. Number 166. Okay. 166 is uh, National Wild Turkey Federation, Kansas Central Chapter in Salina. Their choice is a deer. One of the things that I left out of my uh, earlier uh, introduction was that a chapter or an organization can only draw one of these once in a three-year period. So while, while a DU chapters, the chapters are all handled independently, but each of those chapters um, can only draw one of these in, in once in a three-year period. Okay, I'm going to draw for Commissioner Ryder. Number 29. Okay, number 29 is Ducks Unlimited Leavenworth chapter, and their choice is a deer. Commissioner Sill. Number 19. Okay, number 19 is Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, the national chapter. And they chose an elk, which is gone. So they their second choice is deer. Hang on a second. We want to make sure this is fair. That one popped out. Commissioner Sporer, number 108. 108, Sheila. Number 108 is Pheasants Forever, McPherson Area Chapter, and their choice was deer. The last one, Commissioner Lauber, number 68, 68. Okay. Number 68 is Ducks Unlimited, Upper Republican Chapter, and their choice is deer. That's the last one. So I will conclude this unless there are any questions from the commission or the public. Okay, thank you, Mike. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the next item, Rich Schulte's webless migratory bird regulations. 
Thank you much, Chairman Lauber and Commissioners. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. This is Rich Schultes, Wildlife Research Assistant Director and Migratory Game Board Coordinator for KDWP here in Emporia, Kansas. I'm joining you today to talk about the Webless Migratory Game Bird Regulation Cycle for 2022. As you're well aware, regulations for doves, cranes, snipe, rails, woodcock, and crows must adhere to federal frameworks similar to the process we follow for waterfowl. However, unlike waterfowl, stability in federal frameworks does allow us to include webless migratory game bird seasons, limits, excuse me, in, to include seasons and limits in permit regulation. A summary of those regulations is available in the webless migratory game bird briefing book item. Recent changes to webless regulations that you may recall include splitting the Sandhill Crane hunting unit into west and central zones with different season dates for 2020 and changes to exotic dove regulations back in 2019. For the 2022 season, no changes to the federal framework for webless species uh, will be taking place. We do anticipate proposing a change to the wording of 115-2520 that would clarify the requirement of completing the Sandhill Crane test prior to hunting versus prior to purchasing the Sandhill Crane hunting permit. This change is, reflects a clarification and simplification of the, the wording in the language in the regulation and would bring it in a better alignment with our unlicensing and permitting system. Finally, a summary of potential 2022 season dates and limits under current regulations is provided at the bottom of the briefing book item. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Chairman Lauber, explain to me again about the Sand Hill Cranes. You, you can or can't take the test after you purchase the permit. Yeah, so currently the regulation, uh, the way the regulation reads, um, it, it implies that the requirement is to, to complete the Sand Hill Crane test prior to purchasing the permit. And the attempt there, of course, is we want to have folks that complete that test before they're hunting cranes. And, you know, with the changes to more and more folks going the route of online purchasing and our licensing and app system, it makes more sense just to make sure that that regulation is in alignment with that process where generally folks are going to be going through purchasing their permits. And then it would probably generally folks would purchase that permit. It would direct them to that um, test. They can complete the test. So they would still be within compliance of the regulation. So it's no real change to the intent, intent excuse me, of that regulation. It's just a wording component there that we want to make sure that everyone's on the same page. Okay. Any other questions for Rich? Well, you did a good job. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, up next is Tom Bedrowski. Bedrowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't, do, I don't know how to, is it Bedrowski? Bedrowski, just as you pronounced. Correct. All right. Well, I sometimes stutter through that. No disrespect intended. Tell us what you have on your mind today. Thank you. Tom Bedrowski, Waterfall Program Manager, Great Bend, Kansas. Today I'll be covering season dates and bag limits for the 2022-2023 waterfall seasons. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, with inputs from the Flyway Councils and who developed frameworks with states, are allowed to establish their migratory game bird hunting seasons. These frameworks establish maximum bag and possession limits, season lengths, and the earliest and latest closing dates. States must operate within these frameworks when establishing state-specific migratory game bird seasons. A briefing item was prepared in the commission packet regarding developments of the 2022-2023 waterfowl seasons. Included are the proposed U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services frameworks and pertinent background material. The only change to the frameworks from previous is that mergansers are now included as part of the daily bag limit and possession limits where previously they were a separate item. We are in the scoping process and staff recommendations for season dates will be presented at the March commission meeting. With that, I'd be glad to address any questions. Uh, Chairman Lauder, as one of the items that continues to surface among correspondence to uh, commissioners is the pressure, non-residents, of course, as always comes up. And uh, I'm not proposing an answer to the issue, but if you have any thoughts on that, or are you strictly looking at the resource and not 
taking that into consideration? Um, you know, we take it in great consideration of hunter preferences and the quality of Kansas waterfowl hunting. You know, we had pro provided some information back in the spring and summer on, on the item, and we're con continuing exploring options as this is a pretty complex issue that, you know, we'll take a variety of approaches to if we wanted to preserve Kansas waterfowl hunting heritage. Okay, well, and I, I was sure, sure that you did. Uh, also, I want to commend you on your continued explanation to constituents on the southeast on the southeast zone. Everybody who lives in the southeast zone wants to change the boundaries, and uh, I don't know what the answer to that. When do we? When is the five-year period up to where we? can reconsider changing boundaries? So last year was the first of five years. So we got another three years of regulation processes go before we again have the open season to move zone boundaries. This being the second year of the seasons. Yeah, I don't know whether Commissioner Ryder gets lots of people in his area wanting to change the boundaries. Uh, Commissioner Ryder, I haven't heard a, a lot of discussion about changing boundaries. Um, uh, just uh, sometimes when we get closer to those time periods uh, on discussing that, um, you know, some of the northern uh, parts of the unit sometimes look at that. Uh, but um, not too much of that. Boundaries, anyway. We've got a long time to think about it. Any other questions for Tom? Yeah, Tom, uh, Commissioner Spohr, <laughs> uh, early on it was, uh, you know, right after the opener of duck season, you know, kind of mid-November, uh, you or Brad or somebody had asked all the land managers to report on the activity of, resident versus non-residents on public lands. And that, I felt like that was a very, very good report uh, and kind of give it, gives us a little history of what's happening on public lands. Did you ever ask the land managers to repeat that later in the year or was that just a one time deal? No, with our current electronic check-in system, it, it makes it easy. And most of the time we do make some reports or either at the area levels or like when we presented last year's information um, where we look at all the wildlife areas. So that would, would probably be best addressed by Stuart. But as you said, we something at the end of the seasons that's easily tallied and, and most of them or manager, managers can give you an updated report pretty frequently as they're examining that. Yes, this was this this was all waterfowl areas, including the reservoirs out west that don't have ice sportsmen attached to them. So this was a pretty broad statewide report. And I guess uh, is Stewart available to ask? Is he is he on? Stewart is on, and he has his hand up. Yeah, good, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Stuart Schrock, Director of Public Lands out of Pratt. Uh, Commissioner Sporia, yeah, I was the one that had sent, uh, sent that out to all of you to review as a means to help you understand and see what's going on, on the ground at our, at our public uh, wildlife areas. And not, like you said, not just our ice sportsman properties, but our non ice sportsman properties, including large reservoirs. So my, my plan was that I would send that initial report out for the first half of, of season or, or the, the majority of the regular duck season. And then at season's end, I would give you an update on the, the remainder of the season that was not reported on from those properties. So look for that once the regular duck season has closed. I'll be sending that out to you all. And I do appreciate your, your uh, positive response for that. I was hoping that, that you would benefit from that. And it sounds like you have. So that's, that's something I'd like to keep doing to, to help keep you all informed. Good. Any other questions for Tom? Uh, Commissioner Spohr, Tom, are you done with your whole presentation? Is this it for you or you got more to go? 
Uh, no, to say that today's discussion is really just the beginning of the scoping process and staff recommendations will be presented at the March meeting. And so just covering what the federal frameworks uh, will be for this year and, and moving on from there. Well, I, I guess Commissioner Spore again, you know, I'm still uh, extremely concerned about the non-resident pressure on public lands and waterfowl. Uh, I, I just don't think anything has changed this year. And I guess I'm, I'm going to be pushing for, for something. I, I just, the, the quality of our hunting, you know, given the current pressure that we have, it just can't be maintained on public lands. And I guess I'm looking for, I'm looking for some help. I don't know, you know, I've got lots of ideas, but uh, I'm certainly gonna be looking for something to help alleviate the pressure on public lands due to this waterfowl and the influx of what we've had. Uh, you know, I, I think a public land pass, a 10-day pass, that's worth a hundred dollars per zone for non-residents and all the funding would be put into a fund to purchase and or improve public lands. Um, you know, I guess that's my start of what I think needs to be done to curb the uh, enormous pressure that we have had the last couple years. You know, waterfowling has changed. It's, it's different than it used to be. There, and, and, and I know the agency has proved to me that there were more hunters back in the 90s and early 2000s than they are today. But there, there's no doubt that the waterfowling and the pressure that's being put on these ducks and geese and then becoming nocturnal creates poor hunting conditions. There's just, there's no doubt that that's, that's the argument. Uh, if we don't do something, the common resident waterfowler is going to be the loser on this whole subject if we don't start making a move to do something to curb the pressure. Uh, I guess I'm just, I'm just looking for help. Uh, and I guess we're gonna have more discussions later on, but I guess we can work on it from there. That's all I got. Okay, uh, Tom, did you have a response? Sure, Tom Madrowski, Mike Tory Gamebird, program manager. Um, you know, the, the non-resident issue is a very serious issue for us for the future of water following. Um, it's a very complex issue and, and maybe, you know, it's probably best addressed outside of this agenda uh, briefing item or agenda item. It's just, you know, to work on water follow season dates and have the non-resident issue part of an, a larger discussion. And, and Stuart will probably cover part of that in his presentation next. Okay. Uh, I see some other hands up. You have Bob Davis. Bob, I'm going to unmute you now. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. I know um, I've had conversations with Tom in the past uh, regarding uh, the waterfowl season, specifically with the drought situation that we have up north and the potential you know, probably some very restricted waterfowl seasons coming forward. But um, in the here and now, I would like to address the fact that we are in day 11 of a closed waterfowl for ducks anyway uh, season uh, here in the southeast zone. And as predicted, and as everybody should be knowing, uh, the ducks are moving later every year. They're here. They showed up literally the day the season closed on the 2nd. And we have not been able to do a damn thing about it since then. And we got two more days before we have a chance to get back into duck season mode here. So the late zone, originally this zone was called the late Southeast zone, if I recall. 
And to take 13 days out of the month of January to close duck season is ridiculous. Uh, we need to have all 31 days of possible of January in this zone open. And going forward, I would like to really make sure that we have that option going forward. Uh, Opening it on the 6th of November was pretty much a suntan event. We laid out there and had some great time, drank a lot of beer, but no ducks were shot of any consequence. So why don't we have this zone where we're supposed to be, where the days are open when the birds are here? And I'd just like to get that off my chest because right now I'm not very happy with the way this thing ended up being for this year. Okay, thank you. Any other hands up? Uh, Commissioner Ryder, um, just to kind of jump in on that, I've heard quite a bit about a discussion about that, as you guys could imagine. I think we've had uh, correspondence with that. And, and I do appreciate Tom's uh, responses to those uh, to those people that have been concerned about the seasons. Um, Tom, are you, uh, are your guidelines or your thought process still with uh, uh, ensuring the season goes to the last uh, Sunday, um, opening on the Saturday closest to the November 11th, maximizing those holidays and weekends, uh, and, and having that split on that first January? Is that kind of what – you and kind of your group is, is that kind of what you're where you guys still are with that? Correct. You know, we, we've had stable federal regulations for 25 years, but for the Southeast zone, we've had a variety of structures. And so we're trying to create some consistency or stability in that season and have a clear and transparent process. So we're trying to use some decision tools or decision matrix to help that. And like, for example, the Southeast zone, we've listed, you know, what is the most important factor? So while well, the closing on the last Sunday of January is that, you know, kind of moving down to have the split when you're most likely to be frozen and which would be again around the first part of January and then to maximize holidays. And so to catch up Veterans Day on opening day and such. Yeah, uh, the Commissioner Ryder again, uh, I think critical, uh, critically for us, uh, here in the southeast zone, uh, I think that that opening to the closest Saturday of November 11th, I think, is very important. Um, you know, uh, like Mr. Davis kind of uh, alluded to, November 6th is pretty early for us. Uh, even still, though, if you did kind of the 11th as your cutoff, you know, day, you're floating between that November 8th. And then November fourteenth, and I and I think that pretty much base, basically makes it the second Saturday uh, of November opening pretty consistent. Um, and I think if we stayed with that consistency, uh, I think most people, including probably even myself, um, would be um, okay with that. Uh, uh, and that January, maybe that first part of January, that, that five day split there. Um, although there is a lot of talk uh, and I don't, you guys are probably talking within your group about uh, the December, you know, full moon phase uh, where ducks are usually stale. They've been there for a while and then, uh, you know, they're feeding at night, they're gone nocturnal. So I know you've discussed that in the past and, and hopefully we'll continue to look at that. Um, uh, but that consistency with that second uh, Saturday, November, in, in November is uh, a big priority um, for us down here, I believe. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? This is Commissioner Sill. Um, back to some of Commissioner Spore's comments. Um, as part of that discussion, whether it's later in um, some of Stewart's public lands discussion, but regarding the non-residents and the pressure, I, I have some questions maybe even that might include Susan Stephan in some of the research about where the tipping point is for residents versus non-residents, um, particularly in regards to the waterfowl hunting but also across the board with, with both upland and deer is that, you know, are we being overcrowded and, and, and pressured with the non-residents? If the numbers show that no, the pressure isn't there, but the non residents still perceive that, 
there's a human dimensions piece there that can be just as discouraging whether the pressure is real or perceived. I'm not sure if I'm being very clear on that, but at some point, whether it's today um, or in the future, I think that per maybe Susan can elucidate some of that research that might be helpful or contribute to the discussion. Chair, uh, Chairman Lauber, I think the perception is there. It remains to be seen in all cases, whether it equates to more pressure. But I think that this is continuing to come up. And I think that maybe even as soon as the next meeting, Stuart may cover some of these items in his presentation right after this. But I think that we probably want to revisit this as a commission. I think uh, last year, we decided to, oh, we're going to kind of wait and see. Maybe it was an, an unusual year. Uh, it doesn't seem like it's been all that unusual. Uh, so I think we need to have another agenda item in the future sooner than later to have a discussion on this. Uh, I leave it up to staff to figure out how to go about and who's going to make the presentation. But I think we need to have that agenda item coming up maybe in the next meeting. I see one more hand up, or is that Bob again? Yep, it's Bob Davis. I'll unmute you here. So the follow-up to uh, the guidelines, I guess, you're going with with the Southeast Zone in particular. Uh, again, shouldn't the number one concern be we have hunting when the birds are here to hunt as opposed to the convenience of some people that – want to have an earlier season. I mean, I thought it was the whole purpose of having these zones. If they want to hunt early ducks, they have other zones they can go to. Our zones are the later the better. And I cannot fathom having this thing opening around uh, before the 15th of November. If we need to take days out of November, see January, that's really where it needs to be. And again, yes, we have open water in most cases in January, but you know, to get the birds to move up north, we need more time to get them here. And I, again, I, I just can't see that our zone should be penalized for the convenience of a certain date that's, uh, again, I, I don't see the logic behind it. But again, if they want to hunt earlier birds and earlier zones, go to those zones. That's my well, I think I think statistics reveal that there's a fair amount of hunting activity in the earlier part, more than people in the deep southeast zone realize. And uh, having said that, That'll be a discussion item. We'll see what, what staff wants to do. Are there any other hands up? Not seeing anything at this time, Commissioner. All right. Well, we're going to move on to the next agenda item. Tom, thank you very much. Thank you. you did a good job. Uh, the next item is Stuart, public lands update. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Stuart Shrug. Uh, Director of Public Lands out of Pratt. I just wanted to start off by kind of addressing the, some comments that, that you as commissioners have made about the non-resident issue. As promised, this, this has been an ongoing uh, conversation within Public Lands and, and the Wildlife Division and within the entire department. And, and it's something that, that we know is still a hot topic. Um, it's, it's part of our conversations routinely as we continue to monitor the data um, that's coming in through our ice enforcement properties relative to waterfowl seasons. Um, and that's, that was part of my reasoning for sending out that, that initial first half of the season report to you all. So you could uh, monitor situations on the ground as we are too. So I just want to make sure that you understand that we are uh, still continuing to take this topic very seriously. We're looking at it all the time, having conversations and, and we'd be more than glad to, to come back um, at the next meeting with, with further information uh, in regards to this topic. Some of it might be kind of hit on in the subsequent uh, regulations that I'm gonna be talking about here uh, today. So if, if any of that pertains to th this topic, please, please ask questions as I go along. So with that, um, I'm gonna be specifically covering a few public lands regulations. Um, that we have been discussing and looking at for proposed changes. And I'll start off with uh, KAR 115.8-1 subsection E, which covers our public lands uh, special use restrictions. 
Um, and the first uh, section that, that I want to uh, bring to your attention is, is under access restrictions. Um, if you remember the last go around, you all uh, voted on and approved a uh, access restriction at Neosho Wildlife Area that, that hunters could not access the wetland pools there uh, prior to 5 a.m. and they could had to be out of the, the wetland pools within an hour after uh, legal sunset. Um, we had also at the time discussed uh, the potential for implementing that as well at Cheyenne Bottoms. However, we, we decided to uh, wait on that and, and evaluate what was going on at Neosho this year um, to come back with potentially the same uh, recommendation for the bottoms. Um, from a report from the from Neosho uh, on this new regulation that you guys approved last, last go around, uh, while they were met with a little bit of negativity on the opening weekends after explanations as to why we implemented it, everybody seemed to be on board and understood that it was for the benefit of not only the ducks coming back in and staying in the, in the uh, wetland, but also the potential to increase their, their success rate while, while on the property. Um, and I just wanted to make note too that, that Monty and Travis are on this Zoom this afternoon. So if you would have any questions for them, I'm sure they'd be glad to get on and, and uh, discuss those with you. Um, there was some concern about maybe conflicts at boat ramps and people stacked up waiting to get into the marsh. Uh, prior to 5 a.m., but there really were no negative conflicts. Like I said, we had to just do some initial education, um, and so far, everybody's been compliant, and once an explanation is given, they understand why we implemented that and have actually been thanked for doing what we're doing. So as that relates back to the bottoms, we understand that we'd be dealing with a larger constituency there, uh, which would create additional challenges. Um, I don't believe we staff are, are looking at a 5 a.m. Uh, um, access time. It would be uh, prior to that, earlier than that, because of the larger number of, of hunters that utilize that property. Um, but I would suspect that the recommendation would come down that the, the, they would desire that hunters exit the marsh within an hour after sunset, like we do at Neosho. So all the staff that's, that's uh, relative and, and involved with Cheyenne Bottoms operation and management have been uh, discussing this and we'll continue to discuss this and hopefully we'll have some sound recommendations at the first workshop session. So any questions on that uh, public lands reference document section? Yes, this is Commissioner Spohr. Uh, can you explain to the commission, I think I know the answer, but I would like you to explain to the commission why at Neosho you have a 5 a.m. start time. What was the reasoning behind the new start time? Well, just like at the bottoms, Stuart Trog, Director of Public Lands, um, Commissioner Sport, just like at the bottoms, we were um, combating the issue of people, especially Especially on prior to opening days, people would come out and, and go into the marsh in the middle of the afternoon on the day before season started. People milling in and out of the marsh throughout the night, disturbing waterfowl, setting up, camping out in the marsh all hours of the night. And, and so uh, staff there at Neosha recommended the 5 a.m. start as, as a means to reduce the disturbance of the ducks where they could stay on the marsh, come back, go to and from the marsh, throughout the night as a refuge period. Um, and so far that's been a success there. So that's that's why we're looking to implement the same thing at the bottoms. Does that answer your question? Yes, this is Commissioner Spohr. I had, I was told by a uh, hunter that at Neosho, the rule was you couldn't enter the water till 5 a.m. And I had heard, and right. I guess, Maybe this is a question for Monty that people would still walk down the dikes early in the prior to 5 a.m. As long as they didn't step in the water, they could walk down the dikes and stay on land and hold their spot. Is that true or false? Commissioner for Stuart Chirag again. Yes, that is true. We, you know, the we set the regulation up with the intent that. Basically, people, hunters couldn't step into the water prior to 5 a.m. Um, one of the complaints was, you know, well, the walk-in hunters are going to have 
you know, the same opportunity to get to a good spot because they, you know, they'll have a head start where the, the, the boating public can catch up to them and, and hopefully reduce conflicts that way. But yes, that is correct. Hunters, walk-in hunters can walk down a dike and at 5 a.m. then they can then step in and set up. Whereas the boating hunters would have to launch at 5 a.m. And, and drive out and set up. And that was the recommendation from staff at Neo Show. Monty, if, if yes. you'd like to, to speak on that, I'd, I'd be glad to hear from you too. Uh, Commissioner or Travis. Robert, so there's not, um, so a walk in hunter could still walk down the dikes at midnight and sit on the dike as long as he or she didn't enter the water. Is that correct? As it's written. As it's written, correct. Monty or Travis, would you like to, to speak on that more in detail? Commissioner Ryan, some of those dikes, you know, run right through the pool. So right. I would think that that might cause an issue. I'm not sure whether people are doing that or not. To prep, maybe Monty or Travis can talk more about that. Thank you. Yeah, and that, that's where I would, I would ask Monty and Travis to provide that input. <laughs> I, I don't know how much of that walk-in traffic they were receiving and, and if that was causing conflicts or heartache between walk-in hunters versus boating uh, access hunters. I see, Monty. Travis. Uh, Monty, which, which one of you start? Okay, so the reason behind it was, um, like Stuart said, was give those ducks and waterfowl uh, unharassed time during the dark hours, which we didn't feel like they were getting uh, for the last few years due to the change in the culture of waterfowl hunting. So that rule was implemented and has been a great success. Um, the original intent was to prevent the boats from going in because they caused the most disturbance. Um, the walk-in hunters are pretty quiet and we didn't feel like that keeping them from walking down the levee was necessarily going to affect whether the duck stayed in the marsh or left the marsh. But when the first boat motor fires up and takes off, the ducks in all the pools take off and leave. So. Okay, Travis, you? you have anything to add? Yeah, more. Okay, is there, any, is there any other questions or any comments from Monty and Travis again? I may have interrupted. Okay, Stuart, you want to go on? Okay, uh, the next section there under the reference document would be for refuges. Um, this is just that we had some donated property um, given to us down in Cherokee County that uh, is addition to Cherokee lowlands, so we just want to uh, designate certain tracts of those new donated lands as refuge. Um, and then the, uh, the last section under the reference document is under daily hunt permits, the, the electronic check-in or iSportsman as it is now. Um, we have not added any additional properties for quite some, some time, two or three years at least. Um, the reason for not doing that is, is we knew we were, were headed or having the conversation of going to a new licensing system. And our intent and goal there was to have a one-stop shop system and not have two separate systems, one for, for logging in and, and buying licenses and permits and another one for checking into to public lands properties. So we're, we're just looking into that and discussing that now that we're, we're transitioning to the Brandt licensing system who has the capabilities of the check-in and check-out. Um, having continued conversations with them, um, as to whether we should just add additional properties gradually or if we should just go all in and go statewide at all public lands properties uh, for check-in and check-out. Um, and, and, and part of that discussion relates back to 
the, the non-resident waterfowl discussion too. And, you know, a lot of these properties that, that uh, we have high uh, waterfowl hunting on, um, like Commissioner Spores uh, referred to on our reservoir properties even, we, we don't have them in the iSportsman uh, program. And so it's harder for us to collect uh, true data, real live data that could potentially weigh in um, and, and have a positive uh, impact on this overall non-resident conversation. So that is something that, that we're, we're seriously discussing is, is implementing uh, electronic check-in and check-out on a statewide basis. So are there any questions about that? Go on. Okay, so the next uh, regulation that I I want to discuss is KR 1158-9 and that is our camping re regulation. Um, it covers all the provisions and restrictions of camping on department lands and waters. What we've been discussing uh, specifically for public lands and when I say public lands I'm referring to our state fishing lakes and wildlife areas um, is we currently have a 14 consecutive day camping stay at, at our state fishing lakes and wildlife areas and the discussion has ensued should we reduce that to seven consecutive days on state fishing lakes and wildlife area? This would not include state parks. And the reason for this discussion, I believe it's come up in past commission meetings is we're really seeing an increase of homeless um, sites, vagrants, transient workers that are really creating a, a large conflict with our, um, or primary users, um, intended users of these properties. Um, it's really become a, a pretty significant situation at our Northeast properties and, and Southeast properties as well. So as a, as a way to, to maybe combat this issue, um, we, we have ensued the discussions of reducing this to seven days on, on state fishing lakes and wildlife areas. Um, it also, you know, with this homeless situation, it, it, it's become, it's starting to become large residential communities. It's just like tent cities and municipalities in that part of the state. Um, and with that comes some, a criminal aspect. Um, department staff, it, take, it takes quite a lot of time um, and effort to uh, address these issues and resolve these issues. So that's, so that's something that we're seriously discussing and considering. Um, we, while we, we believe it, it could negatively impact our primary intended users, our fishing public, our hunting public, and our campers, um, we have discussed if, if the commission were to approve redu a reduction to seven days that we would still for allow uh, the provision of an extended stay uh, through a request and, and written documentation from the manager to stay up to 14 days. So that's kind of the, the scope of what we're discussing. Are there any questions about that? I think that's a good idea, Stuart. Any other questions for Stuart? He has more. Okay. Go ahead. All right. The next next regulation is KR 115.823, and that covers baiting on public lands. Um, this basically outlines the provisions and restrictions for baiting on public lands for hunting purposes. Um, and what's being reviewed and discussed is the regulation currently states that no bait um, can be placed for hunting or prior to hunting. Um, and what we found out is people have found a way around that and they're placing bait on public lands um, for what they're calling wildlife viewing or uh, for, uh, photo, for, for, I'll spit it out, photographing wildlife when they're actually hunting. Um, so we were just act, uh, looking at uh, amending the regulation that would basically say that all baiting is prohibited on public lands for all activities. So are there any questions about that? Are there any questions for Stuart on that one? Does that conclude your report? I have one last one. I've, I sent, I had Sheila send you all a revised uh, briefing item to include, lastly, uh, the topic of trail cameras. Um, I had a, a, a meeting with law enforcement division staff last week, um, my uh, administrative staff and LA administration staff, 
um, the topic of trail cameras came up. Um, this is something that, that we've discussed in the past. Um, it's, it's always a hot topic. We get a lot of calls about trail cameras on public lands every year um, and whether they're allowed or not and whether they should be. So we're discussing trail cams on, on public lands and we're uh, really discussing extensively um, should we prohibit them on public lands. Um, and it, it all ties back to fair chase issues, user conflicts. It's gone from cameras being set up, not just to view wildlife, to, to, to see what deer are out there. It's, it's becoming more of checking on other hunters and who all's hunting in the same property tract of the, of the wildlife area that they are. With that comes uh, theft is issues, privacy issues. Um, with these new cell phone capable cameras where you can view deer and wildlife in real time on a cell phone, and then it, it relates back to 32-1003 under you know, methods of take and, and, and not using uh, mechanical devices to locate or, or take games. So um, we're having that in-depth conversation and, and hopefully we'll come back to the next workshop with a recommendation for you on, on trail cameras on public lands. So I would, that's all I have commissioner and I would take any further questions. All right. Uh, I just noticed a hand up. Did somebody have a hand up, Jason? Yes, we got Marshall. I'll unmute you now. <clears throat> yeah, Stuart Marshall locked us here with Kansas BHA. Um, I just had a question regarding the uh, baiting regulation you're considering. Would that affect um, trapping on public land or is that primarily um, baiting for big game? No, it, it would be our intent, excuse me, Stuart Trog, public lands director. It, it would be our intent not to affect trapping in any, in any manner on public lands. Okay, thank you. Any more discussion? Any more questions for Stuart? Commissioner uh, Sell, um, I found it interesting as I listened in to at some of the WAFWA meetings um, last week um, and things that other states are doing with both baiting and especially the game cameras in restricting both of those on public lands and learning that there are companies out there now that are setting up cameras and selling images so that you don't even have to set up your own camera, which is another aspect of commercialization and could easily, um, I guess my mind's a lot smaller than that. So to hear that they're actually doing and progressing that way is not new news to you, I'm sure, Stuart, but um, it was kind of surprising to me. And so I do encourage the um, the discussion of that item and, and where that might go. And especially even as it relates to um, long-term view of drones, other things that I know were restricted now, but keeping that long-term view of where technology is taking us and be preemptive in our work. So thank you for what you're doing. Yeah, I think that some of that technology is going to be difficult to stop on private land, but I'm not sure it has much place on public land. Uh, that's my two cents worth. Any other questions or any final comments from you, Stuart? Yeah, uh, Commissioner Lobber, I just wanted to uh, reiterate what Commissioner Spohr was, was alluding to, and I, and I appreciate your, your comments on that. Um, it has been interesting to see what Arizona and Utah have done recently, and not only have they prohibited them on public lands, but also private lands, which is a, pr a pretty huge thing. Um, you know, in, in the relation to the baiting uh, topic, too, we are finding, too, that we are still combating illegal bait sites, too, and typically there's a trail cam associated with that as well, so this has kind of addressed both issues as, as well, so... Um, Commissioner, uh, Chair, Mr. Chairman, that's all I had for today, and I thank you for your time. All right. Uh, Commissioner uh, Lauber, Chairman yeah. Lauber, I do have a question from um, Ryan Sothers. I'll unmute him. He has a question for Stuart about public lands. Commissioner 
All right, can you hear me? Yes. All right, Stuart, I have a question. You have a place like Mil Milford Wildlife Area outside of Manhattan and Clay Center where you have right. agricultural fields that lay within the boundaries of the wildlife area. How is that going to impact your no bait regulations? Because you're going to have people that are going to want to hunt those soybean, mm -hmm. corn fields, milo fields that are already there because they're baited all the time. Correct. Stuart Schrag, again, Director of Public Lands. Um, it's how we word it within the regulation. It goes back to placing bait and how we define bait within that regulation. We don't want to uh, recommend anything that would pro prohibit hunters from hunting over a standing crop or re residual crop or anything like that. It's placed bait that's brought in to the properties that, that we're looking at, at uh, discussing and, and hoping to have some recommendations. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I'm just afraid that because you're going to have those places that have the ag fields that you're going to see more traffic come to them if you're not going to have them have the ability to bait themselves, which I understand why there's no reason to bait, but I just don't want to get too many guys in the woods in one spot. Correct. And, and we've had this baiting regulation, you know, baiting hasn't been allowed on public lands for several years. This was implemented years ago. We're just trying to change the language that baiting isn't allowed for any activity to, to uh, address those go around uh, users that are saying they're using it for photography or viewing instead of when they're actually hunting. So, but baiting has been on, has been prohibited on public lands for several years now. All right, and thank it, you. And it, and it does not affect standing crops, or <coughs> it's just placed bait that's brought in. Okay. All right, any uh, other questions? Yeah, the Commissioner Ryder, this point brought up a, another thing that uh, I wanted to address earlier with uh, baiting. Um, and this might be more for law enforcement. Is there, um, have we seen a lot of uh, baiting with, for waterfowl um, or citation? I know it's pretty hard, but um, to kind of see that, but I was just kind of trying to get a feel for kind of the Kansas landscape when it comes to uh, waterfowl baiting. Stuart? Yeah, Chairman Lauber, I, I don't have any of that uh, data, Commissioner Ryder. I, I can get with Colonel Kaiser and, and get a report to you. Um, my officers in public lands, uh, I, don't, I don't usually receive any baiting reports like that when it comes to waterfowl hunting. It's all mostly for deer and, and you know, piles of corn on the wildlife area for big game hunting, but, but I can reach out to my staff as well and look at some of the statistical reports that they submit um, to, to, to report back to you all on that, on that question. Yeah, Commissioner Ryder, I, I didn't know how much uh, our state officials and, and, and federal uh, game wardens kind of coordinated and, and anything along those lines. I was just uh, wondering about that earlier uh, in the year and, and this kind of reminded me, so. Yeah, our, our law enforcement division officers coordinate annually all the time with, with Fish and Wildlife Service agents on that baiting issue. It's kind of a, it's a, just an annual expectation that, that there's going to be cases to be addressed. And, and I see Colonel Kaiser's on now, so I'll turn it over to him. Um, Commissioner, this is uh, Colonel Kaiser, Law Enforcement Division, Wildlife Parks. We have, a uh, in, in the weekly minutes I get every week, uh, it seems like we have seen an uptick in some baiting cases uh, for waterfowl uh, that, that my officers have been working this, this past fall, um, maybe more so than what I've seen last year. So I don't know what the, what's behind that, but, uh, and those, a lot of those cases are all being investigated or pending. So I haven't seen the outcome of them, but there, I have seen an uptick in them. Are these particular cases just people throwing corn in a marsh or manipulating fields? Uh, Commissioner Lauber, uh, Colonel Codge Wildlife Parks. Yes, it, it seems like uh, some of the things that I've read has been like in ponds and, and uh, um, some of the wildlife areas um, in the marshes, uh, some of our officers have, have worked some cases on those. So um, 
like I said, it, it just seems like it's a, a little bit more prevalent this this past uh, this season than last. And um, but they're doing a good job on on, on working those cases. So um, the commissioner Ryder again. I think what kind of got me thinking along those lines is the the competition that we're seeing in, on uh, a lot of our public lands. Uh, wetland areas uh, kind of going back to commissioner spores point is maybe driving people to do things that maybe they wouldn't normally do but because of that competition um, and their frustration uh, that might be something that some people might resort to on uh, to to attract waterfowl to maybe a uh, a farm pond or something a body of water that might not normally be uh, attractive to waterfowl so Appreciate that and, and, and all the work that uh, law enforcement's doing. Okay, are there any other questions for Stuart? Any other questions from the public? All right, let's move on to the next item, which is Linda Latterman. You missed one, military deer season. Oh, I did. My mistake. That's uh, Levi. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd have, I'd have been okay, I guess, but we'll cover this one. Uh, Levi Jasper, Emporia, Kansas, uh, big game coordinator. Uh, so this is the KR 11525-9A which is the military facility deer seasons. Um, and we'll cover all three of those facilities uh, in this one regulation. Uh, and so we've traditionally uh, set these, these seasons uh, later than our regular statewide seasons to be able to allow time to adjust in case of training schedules uh, or other military activities that we may not know at the time. Um, so we're introducing this today and our typical public hearing on this regulation is held in June. Um, so with that, uh, we'll start with Smoky Hill. Uh, they're requesting the same seasons as uh, statewide. Uh, and then they would also under statewide still allow five uh, white-tailed deer antlerless only permits. Uh, that would then take us to Fort Riley. Uh, they have requested the same seasons as statewide with the following exceptions. Uh, they want to allow additional archery days uh, for authorized individuals. Those typically are troops that are going to be uh, going on deployment uh, during the regular season uh, to give them an opportunity to hunt if they choose. And so those additional days uh, would be September 1st through September 11th. Um, and then also for troops that have were, were deployed but returned, uh, they also add uh, January 1st, uh, 2023 through January 31st, 2023 as additional days solely for those individuals authorized by Fort Riley. They also want to add additional days of uh, for designated persons, uh, youth and people with disabilities from October 8th through October 10th of 2022. Uh, that is the same dates as our pre-rut antlerless whitetail season. Uh, and then they want to not have the pre-rut antlerless season during that time. So it would only be uh, another three days of designated persons hunting. And then their firearm season dates would be November 25th through November 27th, December 17th through December 23rd, and December 26th through December 27th. Uh, so that breaks up their firearm season. Uh, they don't get any more than the standard 12 days as our statewide season is, but it's broken up, but that can give uh, folks an, some additional opportunity to hunt at the fort too. Um, and also allows them some scheduling around holidays and such. Uh, they uh, are not going to, 
request are requesting not to have an antlerless deer season in January. Uh, and they would only allow uh, one whitetail antlerless only permit on the fort. And so that is all for Fort Riley. Uh, the last property is Fort Leavenworth. Um, they request all the same as statewide with the exceptions of their open firearm season uh, being mostly on weekends. Uh, so that would be November 12th through 13th, November 19th and 20th, November 24th through November 27th, December 3rd through December 4th and December 10th through December 11th. Um, again, they just get the same amount just shifts the dates that the firearm season occurs on Fort Leavenworth. And then their extended firearm season for antlerless only would be January 1st through January 22nd, which is our longest uh, antlerless whitetail season. And then uh, also to allow uh, participation in the extended archery season, which would be January 23rd through January 31st. And then uh, they would continue with uh, their five, allowing the use of five whitetail antlerless deer only permits on the four as they've done uh, previously. And so that uh, concludes the dates uh, requested for military facilities um, that again, we introduced now so that we can have more time in case of training or other military activities uh, that we would then vote on in June. So with that, I would take questions. Are there any questions for Levi? Okay, thank you. Uh, now it's time. Looks uh, like uh, looks Secretary like Brad. Loveless. Yeah, thank you. No questions for Levi, but I want, just wanted to report. I happened coincidentally to be up on Fort Leavenworth last night. Um, addressing their uh, rod and gun club with a great bunch of attendees, a lot of avid deer hunters there. And I, I must have had four or five people that specifically uh, said thanks to our department for flexibility in the commission for recognizing the special needs of their uh, military members and, and accommodating these, these requests. They really appreciated that. They were hurting a little bit because their best unit is kind of compromised. They've got some construction in there this season and they're excluded from that unit. So their harvest is, is down to about 20% uh, of what it was a year ago. So that's bothering them. That's through no fault of ours, just an inconvenience there with conflicting activities on the fort. But they were super appreciative of all the adjustments that you all make to accommodate their military members. So I'll pass on that, thanks. Good. If there are no other questions for Levi, now we'll move to Linda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Linda Lannerman, Kansas State Parks Director. And uh, thank you commissioners for letting me present today. I will be presenting the free park entrance day in the free um, fishing weekend, which is June 4th and 5th. Each state park will have three free days uh, this coming year. Every park will have uh, May the 7th, which is our Let's Camp America Day. It it's, uh, starts off our camping season. And then we always have uh, Opt Outside Day, which is the traditional Black Friday. And then each state park will have their own free day in their state park, and that will be different all across the state. And typically those are our OK Kids Days. Um, it may be co coincide with a free fishing weekend um, or uh, national or chili cook-off contest, several events that go on in state parks that we have for uh, free days for pe the public to enjoy. And I think Sheila sent those to you and we will have those signed by secretary's order. And I'll take any questions if you have them. Are there any questions for Linda? Hmm. Well, okay, thank you. Thank you. Let's move now to the workshop session. Big game four series. Levi, it's you again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Levi Jastrimporia, Kansas. Uh, 
this is the big game four series permanent regulations. Um, I will address the regulations that we are uh, requesting some changes on. Uh, the first one of those is uh, KAR 115 4-6. Um, this did not make it into the printing of the briefing book. I provided Sheila with an updated uh, briefing book item to reflect this. Um, this came to my attention uh, Monday of this week. And with our deer management units, the boundaries have been set for, uh, you know, the original boundary units were set back in 1965. Um, we've addressed those as we've needed to uh, through time. Um, but uh, recently within the last year or two, uh, KDOT has rerouted a portion of the boundary between units uh, five and six uh, on highway K-14. It is now uh, loops closer to Hutchinson. Um, and so I have a uh, map here, if I can get it to display. All right. Can you see the map now? Um, so anyways, with that, K-14 now currently runs farther east. Uh, they've renamed the segment of K-14 that was the historical boundary and technically still is the boundary uh, as intended. Uh, to Sego Road. And so that encompasses about 100 square miles within that area. And so the recommendation would be uh, that we're proposing is that uh, we run down K14 to Sego Road. And at that intersection, we then take Sego Road down to uh, the highway south there. Um, so it would not actually change the boundary as it had been previously. It's just adjusting for that reroute of the highway and change in name. Um, okay. So it also, that splits uh, a couple of different uh, antlerless seasons too. So we've already had, uh, what brought it to my attention was a phone call from a gentleman who was confused as to what season he actually was in. Uh, right now. So, um, so if there are questions about that adjustment to the boundary uh, description, are I there would... any questions for Levi? If not, go on. All right. The uh, Next regulation is 115 4-11 Big Game Wild Turkey Permit applications. And we are proposing to adjust for pronghorn hunters uh, to choose to either purchase a preference point or be or having been unsuccessful in limited draw um, to not, or if they purchase an over-the-counter counter archery permit uh, so right now they could uh, get a permit and also get a point in the same year if they would go get an archery permit. And so we'd like to modify it so that they could either get an archery permit or apply for a limited draw permit, but not do both in the same year. Um, the purpose of this is to try and address point creep uh, where uh, the continued uh, gain of points for folks makes it harder and harder to get a permit over time. Um, and so, uh, and with that, 35% of archery permit holders uh, have limited draw points and 135 of those were just from the last year alone. And there were 273 uh, over the last three years, um, just, just to, you know, in some, the ability for the hunters to obtain a preference point 
for a limited permit while also obtaining an archery permit is contributing to some current issues of pronghorn hunting. And we'd like to address, uh, help address this by removing a, a double dipping, basically. Okay, any questions for Levi on that? Well, are you, is that in this portion? That was the end of the four series. All right, now go to the Deer 25 series. Wow. All right, the Levi Jaster Emporia, Kansas, Deer 25 series is typically where we set our uh, season dates. Um, and also uh, we'll address some uh, antler, use of antlerless deer permits on uh, wildlife areas. Um, and several areas in the past have had an exception to the statewide uh, regulation that only one whitetail antlerless deer permit may be used on those areas uh, when numbers were higher and we we're having some crop damage issues nearby. Uh, and so we allowed uh, all five white tenantless permits to be used at Glen Elder, Canopolis, Lovewell, Norton, Webster, Wilson Wildlife Areas, and Kerwin National Wildlife Area. Mm -hmm. And now with uh, lower populations, less uh, trouble around the boundaries of those areas, managers to provide a more even opportunity amongst folks and maintain higher deer numbers for hunting opportunities would like to reduce uh, back to the statewide uh, regulation of those wildlife areas only allowing one antlerless permit. Uh, so again, those uh, areas are Glen Elder, Canopolis, Lovewell, Norton, Webster and Wilson Wildlife Areas and Kerwin National Wildlife Refuge. Most of these are uh, areas located in the north central northwest uh, portion of the state. And then that brings us to the uh, dates for the statewide seasons that are proposed. And I'm going to uh, share again. Uh, my screen, get a calendar, oh, there we go. And so the proposed dates for the 2022 to 2023 uh, deer seasons would be youth and disability, September 3rd through September 11th, muzzleloader and archery, uh, both start concurrently on the 12th, muzzleloader would then end on the 25th, Archery would then run to December 31st. The pre rut whitetail antlers only season uh, would be the three days around the Columbus Day holiday, uh, which is the 8th through the 10th of October. Our regular firearm season would start on November 30th, which is the Wednesday after Thanksgiving as traditional and run through the 11th of December. And then the first whitetail antlerless uh, season only season would be January 1st through January 8th. The second would extended season would be January 1st through January 15th. And the third would be January 1st through January 22nd. And then the extended archery season, which is only in uh, currently in DMU 19, the urban unit up around Kansas City, Topeka, would uh, add January 23rd through January 31st. Um, all the seasons follow pretty much our uh, traditional uh, dates that we've used in the past, uh, for sure the last year over time. So uh, with that, that is all I have for the 25 series regulations and would we'll take questions. Are there any questions for Levi? Well, thank you very much. Uh, is Matt up next? Yep. Antelope, Matt.
Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. All right, so I'm going to be presenting on uh, KR 115.25.7 antelope open season bag limit and permits. Um, we're not recommending any changes to this regulation at this time. And the proposed season structure, season dates, and um, permit types are all standard. And I presented those in the, the past couple of meetings. The one thing we're waiting for on this regulation that we don't uh, have for you yet is promote, proposed permit allocations. And we're still trying to get the winter aerial pronghorn surveys completed. And we'll, have, uh, we'll make permit recommendations based on the results of those surveys. So we'll have them for you at the next meeting. We have completed the harvest analysis since uh, the last commission meeting. And the harvest report is available on the KDWP website on the pronghorn page. Uh, if anybody wants to look at that. But among the highlights of, of this report are that um, permit demand for these permits has really increased as of late. From 2008 to 2018, we were typically in the vicinity of, of 1,500 people who were either applying for permits, buying preference points for limited permits, or buying over-the-counter um, archery permits. And that number has steadily increased over the past three seasons to uh, over 2,500 this year. And so it already takes five to, seven, five to seven preference points for a general resident to draw a firearm permit in Unit 2, which is our most um, uh, sought after permit opportunity. And so the result of this increased demand uh, could be some serious point creep. Uh, in the future to where 10 or preference points, 10 or more preference points could be allowed uh, to get those high demand permits. So we're watching that issue closely and um, seeing how that goes. Another highlight from the report is that the archery permit sales remain high. Uh, two years ago, we sold 402 of these in, in 2020. I, when I say two years ago, I'm referring to 2020 season. Uh, we sold a little over 400 of these archery permits. And this year we sold 377, which was our third highest on record. The 2020 total was the highest. And so, um, and we're starting to get some complaints. I've mentioned this at past meetings, but some of the archery hunters, especially those going to the parts of unit two, where a lot of walk-in hunting areas are present, are starting to uh, get a little bit concerned about some crowding issues. And so we're watching that. And then the, the, the um, change that Levi mentioned regarding applications is the first thing we're trying to do to address this. Um, one last finding of note that, uh, is in the pronghorn harvest report from this year is um, despite the pronghorn populations having declined somewhat according to our, our surveys that we've conducted. And again, we're waiting on this year's winter, winter survey in a couple of units, but um, it appears that populations have declined over several years. The success rate from last season did uh, remain high, particularly for archery and and firearm permits, which remained out or above uh, long-term uh, averages. We generally expect muzzleloader permit success to be around 60%, and it has fallen to about 50% over the last couple of years. And, uh, but this is not obviously a, a huge reduction in success rates there, so that's nothing to be terribly concerned about. The one area that we did see a drastic reduction in success was in Unit 18, where firearm and muzzleloader permit success combined fell to just 30 percent, which is really low. But we've gradually been cutting permits in that unit, and there were only 10 of those permits available. So really the difference between what we saw this year and what we would expect to see um, is only two or three, the harvest of two or three pronghorn total made the difference there. So that could very well um, just have been by a chance. Although, like I said, our surveys in that unit do show uh, declines over time and our, and our permit allocations have, have uh, decreased in response to, to that. So with that, I'll turn this back over to you, Mr. Chairman. Any questions for Matt? 
Do you have any rough guess as what the aerial surveys are going to show? Um, I don't think things have gotten any better in Unit 18. Uh, ever since the drought there, they have not reproduced as they should, even during what appear to be decent weather years. And so um, the, the population there appears to have dropped back to where it was in the early 2000s when we first established muzzleloader hunting. And prior to that time, it had only been archery. And so, um, and, and that's a big loss because the Cimarron National Grasslands, when, when pronghorn numbers were good down there, was kind of a destination for archery hunters where they could go out there and hunt, you know, uh, one of our few big public land areas uh, in the state. And so there was a lot of people that went there and so I'm not real optimistic in seeing an increase down there in unit 18. Uh, unit 17, I'm a little bit more optimistic. Uh, and of course the unit figures are in the briefing book there, if any of you are unfamiliar with them, but um, we have had de decent production a time or two in unit two. It seems like a little bit farther north and maybe parts of unit 17, uh, reproduction has been a little bit better. So. We'll see what things show. I think there's also been some movement out there at times um, that uh, causes them to leave certain areas. Uh, the biologists out there have talked about an increase in corn, which isn't real. You know, they, they want to be able to see a long ways. And so at the times of year when the corn has grown up tall in certain areas, they're probably not going to be in that vicinity, although they will cut the corners and be around cornfields to some degree. It's just, if there was enough of it on the landscape, it wouldn't be real favorable to them. Okay. Any other questions for Matt? Well, let's move to elk. Okay. Yes, this is KAR 115.25.8 elk open season bag limit and permits. And we're in the same situation with elk as we are as pronghorn in that we're not recommending any change to the season structure, season dates or permit types. So both of these regulations have basically been the same for quite some time. The exception is with annual permit allocations. And so as with pronghorn, we're waiting on um, completion of a winter aerial elk survey on Fort Riley, which Fort Riley staff conduct. And once we have the results of that, uh, we will visit with them on, um, permit allocations for the for the year. Uh, the current season is ongoing and runs through March 15th and so we don't have any final results to report but we did but uh, hunting on Fort Riley has ended and um, they uh, sent us the their um, results of their season for those individuals who had permits on Fort Riley and I thank Derek Moon for that but I'll tell you that of the of the 12 any elk permits that are valid on Fort Riley, that were valid last year, seven of them were filled and seven of the 18 antlerless only elk permits were filled on Fort Riley. Typically we average about 75% success rate on uh, those any elk permits and about 60% on the antlerless only. So we are below those right below those typical success rates right now but they do still have another two months where those individuals can um, go off, uh, hunt off the fort including in the vicinity of right off the fort and so we would expect a few more of those individuals might be uh, successful by the end of the year and then um, for commissioner es escarino i'll mention that elk are more widespread in the in the state than what a lot of people realize and at least that they seem to at least occasionally show up in all parts of the state. So um, most of the elk on Fort Riley, uh, most of the elk in the state are on Fort Riley and that's considered the main hunt opportunity for your typical uh, general resident. But there are reproducing herds in other part of the state. Uh, probably the main one is out there in your area close to the Colorado line out west of, of Coolidge and uh, in the Syracuse area. And they're, you're probably aware that there's a, a good herd out there of, of uh, 60 to 80 or more. So um, that's a pretty important area for some individuals as well. But um, anyway, the, the sound bite I typically give with elk that 
a few of the commissioners have, have noticed from time to time is that is that in the last five years, we've had elk harvested in um, a quarter of the 105 counties in the state. And so that's just kind of an indication of how uh, how widespread they are. So even though the bulk of them are in a couple of areas there, they do uh, scatter out and at any given time, every year people are surprised to um, have a picture of an elk show up on their trail camera. And in some of those cases, when the elk hangs around in an area long enough, uh, people buy permits and are able to hunt them and get them in some of those counties where, you know, where herds of elk don't reside and you really don't have uh, reproduction. So anyway, that's the current situation with elk. And I'll turn this back over to you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Thank you, Matt. Are there any questions for Matt on any of these matters? Uh, Matt, Commissioner Spohr, can you give us an update on how many over-the-counter tags for elk that you sold thus far this season that um, are in non- I productive areas like you you've just discussed yeah i i have not pulled those uh numbers in a little while i do have um that total from last year here if you can let's see last year we sold 142 of those permits and that number has went up uh, three years ago it was 102 then 123 then 142 and i shouldn't say just away from Fort Riley. Those are the non-Fort Riley permits. So that also includes landowners around Fort Riley, which is a fair number. Uh, Commissioner Spore again, are they required to report their success or their harvest data? Uh, Matt Peak, Emporia Research Office. They're not required, but we do it. We do conduct a census of elk hunters. That means we try to get a report from every one of them. It's not a survey where we're just reaching out to a certain percentage, but we send harvest reports to all of them. And and we get pretty good. Typically, we get pretty good response rate from elk hunters, better than we do uh, with a lot of other hunt types. Yeah. You know, a survey from Southern Thomas County, I normally see a half a dozen elk a year. And it was, I, I've only seen one cow so far this year. So I don't know, that's just an update from Western Kansas, but it just seems like normally I see more and I, I haven't seen that many this year and haven't heard of any harvests either. So thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, Matt, this is Commissioner Cross. Along uh, Commissioner Spore's questioning, I had some people ask me, you know, that we've seen some media on the elk traveling throughout the state. Is Do you know if the herd is up? And if so, how much? Uh, the, only, the only survey that's consistently conducted is on Fort Riley. As you can imagine, it would be hard to conduct any type of a systematic survey of either flights or anything like that in most of the rest of the state. We, we have done it out um, west of Garden City before, but we don't do it every year. And so um, I don't have a specific answer other than the number of um, atypical locations that I hear about is, is consistent. So at, at, it ha I don't think it's declined, I'll say that. The, the fort believes there's a, in the vicinity of 300 there, and that's probably about what they can hold. And I do think that as their numbers grew, that we started getting elk showing up in other places. So in other words, as elk are getting closer to carrying capacity on the fort, there's probably more of them coming off the fort and scattering out and about. And so those are the ones we hear about. But yeah, we don't conduct surveys else, elsewhere, so I can't say precisely, but I think that those, the number of those animals has been consistent and at least not declined. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Commissioner Sill, are you doing any monitoring of CWD with your elk herds? Matt Peak, Emporia Research and Survey. Um, we do, we treat them uh, similar to deer. And so when they're surveying deer out in that area, they can turn elk in as well. But we, we used to have mandatory elk um, 
sample submission to the department and we don't do that anymore. Just basically um, there's few enough of them compared to say deer that we just get more, I guess the opportunities there to get a lot more deer, a lot easier. So we took a, made it non-mandatory. Okay. Any other discussion? Any hands up? We got Emmerich's got his up. That was from last time. Oh. Okay. Uh, that's the end of the uh, afternoon session. If there are no other questions or comments, I'm going to propose that we recess the meeting and we'll reconvene the meeting at 630. Any other questions or comments from anybody? Um, Chairman Lauber, I, we did have another question from Ryan um, Sothers. He missed the original um, non-agenda items topic. Do you want to go yeah, ahead and sure. have him ask it now? Sure. Ryan, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. So hey, which question were you? Um, I was going off of the your first one, the uh, uh, raccoon one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I was curious, curious about if the raccoons were going to get put on as a nuisance animal in order to kind of help with the, the turkey upland bird population. Because like where we're at, I'm in north central Kansas up around the, the Jamestown marsh and I work down in Clay Center and we've got places where we've got game cameras where we see 25, 30 raccoons on one picture and they're just all over the place. And that's pretty common everywhere and everybody that I'm talking to. And I can't see how with that many raccoons around and with the cost that trappers are putting out to get no return on a, on a pelt that's stretched and salted. How are you guys going to combat the, the ever growing population if they're not being harvested. Well, that's a good point, but I don't know the answer. Uh, putting them on as a nuisance animal is going to create certain issues. And uh, I don't know whether authorizing them for nighttime hunting during the coyote season makes sense or not. There's some dog men that probably would rather not see that, so I don't know. Uh, I suppose that's something Matt can look into and see if it needs to have further discussion or consideration. Okay. Do you have any thoughts, Matt? Sure, Matt Peak Emporia Research and Survey. Um, we have the department has a fur bear committee that uh, meets annually, and we do discuss things like this. The houndsmen were wanting to be able to take some uh, raccoons during a, the time now when the season is currently closed, and and we did discuss that in the committee the last time we met, and there's not support at this time. I will say that uh, I don't expect this issue to go away, so we will continue to give it consideration. Um, the concept that trappers won't harvest them because they're not worth anything, and so we should open a long season so more people can harvest them when they're not worth anything, it doesn't, um, you know, I'm not sure how that's going to, you know, how, how that actually would res how opening a, a longer season would result in more harvest when they're not being harvested now. There's no demand for them in season. There's also very little demand for them out of season. That people like yourself who, if you want to see some harvested, you could harvest them in season now just as well as you could out of season. So um, I'm not sure that the, you know, 
that what the net result in harvest would be, but we, we do give it some consideration. Certainly the houndsmen would harvest a few more. And um, I know that the interest in uh, the, the night additional night hunting opportunity isn't going to go away. And that's not to say that the department's going to support anymore. Um, but we are considering all the options, I think. All right. Sounds good. Any other questions for anybody? Any other comments? Brad? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is Secretary Loveless. So, Matt, um, we over uh, in the past months when we've talked about coyote regulations, I, I found it very helpful when you talk about um, long-term population trends in Kansas. Do you have those same kind of data with any kind of confidence for raccoons? Yes, and they and they have raccoons and coyotes, according to our annual roadside survey, which we have data going back to 1980 with raccoons, they have increased more than any other species, according to that survey. And so um, I don't think there's anybody that would contest the notion that raccoon numbers are high right now and very high in some cases. That can change in a hurry in certain areas with something like distemper that can come through and take a bunch of them out. But yeah, that's the natural population control that uh, keeps them from just increasing exponentially, you know, indefinitely. But gotcha. And is that density dependent, Matt? Um, I assume those diseases. I would typically say that they are, but or, or that it is, but I'm not sure that I'm not sure that the dynamics of distemper haven't changed as the raccoon population has gotten so high. And so, what I kind of think has happened is that you used to have a bunch of raccoons in certain areas that the population would get high, and the whole population would be naive to distemper. None of them had had it before, and distemper would come in and it would kill a great many raccoons in that area. I think it's more persistent on the landscape now. We, it doesn't seem to me like we get those extreme die-offs in certain areas like we used to, but that rather it's always out there. And so you have a bunch of adult raccoons that have already been exposed and are relatively immune. And so when it comes into an area, it might kill quite a few of the young, but it doesn't affect the adult population. And that's fairly speculative, but we've also seen gray fox populations decline and they're extremely susceptible to distemper. And so one possibility there, and again, this is very speculative, is that uh, the raccoon, the persistence of distemper in the raccoon population prevents gray foxes, you know, gray foxes get exposed to it now and, and die from it. Whereas before, except in those outbreak areas, gray fox could live in the state and, and not be so likely to encounter distemper. So I think there's, there's research going on, on gray, going on with gray fox in Missouri and I think some of the upper Midwest states that may provide some more insight as to whether those theories are accurate or not. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Mr. Chair. All right. Anybody else? I'm going to recess the meeting and reconvene at 6.30. All right, thanks. Thanks.